Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, we are studying the book of Acts. This message is specifically for August 15th, but you can listen to it any time, morning, afternoon, or evening, even years later. And uh, as we are looking at this, we are seeing the early church working through the issues, witnessing to the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin said, don't preach in this name anymore. And they beat the apostles and then released them. And Gamaliel had given them the advice. You know, some other groups purported to be something and they came to a big fizzle. Fizzle. They fizzled out. And so let's uh, let this group fizzle out also. And if it doesn't, we might be fighting against God. So we don't want to do that. So they took that advice and the church seemed to have a respite for a short period of time in this official stance of just letting it fizzle out. Well, it didn't. But Satan was active and he tried to cause issues uh, in the church. He tries to split a church any way he can, destroy people and get them to fighting among themselves. Uh, and the issue came up in Acts chapter 6 that the Hellenistic Jewish widows were not getting the food like the Hebrew Jewish widows. And so there kind of was a ruckus raised about that. And the apostles, there were just 12 of them, and they had a congregation now that numbered about 20,000 people. 5,000 men, perhaps an equal amount of women, 10,000, and their children, maybe another 10,000. Uh, maybe that's how it played out, but that's how we came up with that number. Well, 12, 12 people over a crowd of 20,000, that doesn't stretch very much. And uh, so uh, they decided to get themselves leaders who could help deal with this so they could concentrate on preaching and prayer. And so as they did this, um, the church kept increasing. And it says here in Acts chapter 6, the word of God kept on spreading and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Well, see, God had the apostles, although they took a beating for it, give their testimony before the Sanhedrin, and many of the priests heard about it. They were talking among themselves. They were hearing about the signs and the wonders and what God was doing. And so as a result, uh, many of them got saved. And uh, so instead of this fizzling, uh, even the priests were getting saved and uh, they were going to not stand for this very much longer. And this is where the situation with the first martyr of the church, Stephen, came into play. We see in verse 8, and Stephen full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. Now, he wasn't an apostle, but he was performing signs and wonders. Now, how could he do that? Well, he was a prophet. He wasn't an apostle, but he was a prophet. Remember, it says that... Uh, the church was built upon the apostles and prophets. And how would you have a person say that they're a prophet and believe them? Well, there was usually a sign or a wonder, some near sign that showed that God was with him. And then therefore you could, uh, um, you could uh, believe what he said because of God being with him. And uh, so this was about uh, 33, 34 uh, A.D. after Christ's birth. And uh, 30 years later into the church, about 67 um, A.D., uh, you have 
the book of Hebrews being written. The temple had not yet been destroyed, so that we know that it could be as late as 69 BC. And uh, look what they were saying about these signs and wonders. In Hebrews chapter 2, and starting with verse 3, How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, they're looking back these 33 years, you see, spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, those were the apostles, God also testifying with them by both signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. That's past tense. God, once again, God also testifying with them back then, but both by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit. So we look back at the past and God confirmed these things by those signs and wonders. Well, that that seems to indicate then to me that those were back then, and that was foundational. And so too with uh, Stephen. I believe that he was being used as a prophet. And one of the things that prophets are supposed to do is to get up into somebody's grill and tell them what God wants them to say. And so this was his task, and he was doing this. It says here in verse 9, But uh, some men uh, from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. Now there's various viewpoints that this might be up to four, four congregations, four synagogues. But regardless, if it's one with these four types of uh, peoples from four different regions, they could all be together and be speaking Greek in the synagogue, or it could be four different ones. I don't really care what your viewpoint is on that. I tend to think it was one synagogue. But nevertheless, uh, these were freedmen from these various areas. Now, what do you mean freedmen? Well, the Jews had been enslaved, and in 6 A.D., the Jews were kicked out of the Roman Empire. They said, get out, leave these, leave the Roman Empire. We don't want you here. And uh, so they left, and as they left, they were given their freedmen, freedom. And in, by 19 AD, there was a collection of these freed men in Jerusalem, but they were Greek speaking, so they had a Jewish synagogue but it was Hellenistic, it was Greek-speaking. And uh, Cyrenean was an African country, Alexandria was in Egypt, and uh, there were some from Cilicia and Asia, and uh, this place called uh, Cilicia, that was the home area of the man who later became the Apostle Paul. So, um, he might have very well been at this synagogue and hearing Stephen and being one of the argumenters, the debaters with Stephen. And uh, so uh, they rose up against Stephen, but they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So how did they know that? Well, somebody ratted out on them. I think it was the Apostle Paul who later said these were trumped up charges. And uh, they, they one of their favorite tactics was to get people on trumped up charges up in front of the Sanhedrin. Then as these people testified, they tripped themselves up with their own mouth. Um, and it says in verse 12, And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. Well, that's probably the Sanhedrin. They put forward false witnesses who said, This man incessantly speaks against 
this holy place and the law. Well, he never did any such thing, but these were false charges. Remember, the holy place and the law. And later on, he's going to deal pretty, pretty well with this in his defense. Verse 14, For we have heard him say that this Nazarene, Jesus, will destroy this place after the customs uh, and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. Well, Jesus said no such thing. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. But they didn't want to deal with that issue. They didn't want to admit that he'd been resurrected from the dead. And uh, then also, Jesus also said, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. Not one jot or tittle will pass away until all these things will be fulfilled. He said that uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17, I came to fulfill the law. Great respect for the law. And uh, so verse 15, it says, And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. Well, there was some appearance about him. He seemed to have his cool he seemed to be at peace. He seemed to think this was a great opportunity for him to once again stand before the Sanhedrin. Remember, Peter and Peter and uh, John had been before them, then all the apostles, and now a third time. And in the meantime, a number of the uh, priests were getting saved. Remember that Nicodemus and was a secret disciple of Jesus, and he was a member of the Sanhedrin, and Joseph of Arimathea, and chances are they were still around, and uh, so they were part of this, and verse 7, chapter 7, verse 1, the high priest said, are these things so? And he said, Stephen, hear me, brethren and fathers. He knew that he was speaking to peers, people that were Jewish, and to people who were uh, considered leaders of Judaism. So he addressed them as fathers and patriarchs. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. So he's going way back to the beginning. When the beginning of the Jewish race started with Abraham, but it was pre-Jewishness, and it was when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Leave your country and your relatives, and come into the land which I will show you. Well, he had no idea what land that was, but he went, you know, not necessarily knowing quite where he'd end up. Verse 4, Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there, after his father died, God had him moved to this country in which you are now living. So he's saying things that are true, saying things that are biblical. He's getting them on board. Yes, this guy knows his biblical history. He knows what he's talking about. He's not some fool and buffoon. Verse 5, but he gave him no inheritance in it not even a foot of ground. And yet, even when he had no child, he promised that he would give it to him as a possession and to his descendants after him. So Abraham believed God. He was trusting in God. Verse 6, But God spoke to this effect, that his descendants would be aliens in a foreign land, and that they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years, and whatever nation to which they will be in bondage, I myself will judge, said God. And after that, they will come out and serve me in this place. Once again, referring to the nation of Israel, this land. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac, and circumcised him on the eighth day, 
and Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. So far, nothing to kick about. He's recited things just exactly how they understand it. Well, this guy isn't so bad. He seems to be speaking the truth. We, let's listen to him further. Verse 9, the patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt. That is extremely true and is recorded in the book of Genesis. Yet God was with him and rescued him from all his afflictions and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh. Here he had rose up in the house of Potiphar. Potiphar's wife took a shine to him. He tried to escape. She ripped his clothes off from him. And then she said he tried to rape her. So he was thrown in jail. Not long after that, he became the keeper of the jail as a prisoner. And he treated the men and helped them. And those in prison, he interpreted their dreams. Lo and behold, Pharaoh needed his dream interpreted. And uh, the butcher remembered uh, the interpretation that was given to him that came true from the mouth of Joseph. And so now Joseph was standing before Pharaoh and giving him the interpretation. And he said, well, it sounds to me like you are a man whose God is with. Can you do this thing of saving uh, grain and whatever in the fat years so that we'll have it through the lean years? And so he put him in charge of that and everything Joseph touched, he did so very well. He was a brilliant man. And pretty soon he was just next to Pharaoh in power. And his, these brothers of his, they show up looking for food. So look in verse 11. Now a famine came over Egypt and Canaan and great affliction with it. And our fathers could find no food. The uh, 11 tribes of Israel their brothers, they couldn't find any food. Verse 12, But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. On the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family was disclosed to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent word and invited Jacob, his father, and all his relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and there he and our fathers died. From there they were removed to Shechem and laid in tomb, which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. Once again, Stephen is spot on. He's telling it just the way it is. Now, so far, he said, look, here was Joseph, and you rejected him, and then he becomes the Savior. But in the time of the promise, but as the time of the promise was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt. There were so many of them. And here they were on the flank of the Egyptians, and they began to become worried. And so a man rose up who did not know Joseph, and he treated them shrewdly and enslaved them in some way. Verse 18, until there arose another king over Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. It was he who took shrewd advantage of our race and mistreated our fathers so that they would expose their infants and they would not survive. It was at this time that Moses was born and he was lovely in the sight of God and he was nurtured three months in his father's home. Now, he's telling us things that we don't even know. There's nothing in the Old Testament that tells how long they tried to hide him. But we know that since it's in the scriptures that this is true. And he was giving little tidbits of information that only somebody who's really on the inside and knows the Jewish history would know. And so he is telling all these things. And here is Moses, who was hid for three months, and then he was put in a river, in a little ark. 
And after he had been set outside, verse 21, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own son. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered his mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. According to Stephen, as we read farther on, it was almost like it was in the mind of Moses that he was uniquely placed to be a deliverer for his people and even supposed that that would be his way of improving their lot. Here he is in the household of Pharaoh, perhaps in line to be Pharaoh, and that if they were patient and he became Pharaoh, he could make their life better because he himself was Jewish. Verse 24, And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. Verse 25, And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him. So he, he saw, I'm uniquely placed. I could maybe help out. But they did not understand. On the following day, he appeared to them as they were fighting together, and he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you injure one another? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away and saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? You do not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? <laughs> what was common knowledge now? They were talking as if the whole world knew. And at that time he decided he'd have to leave because it would trickle up to Pharaoh's house and they would have to put him to death. And so he ran because the avengers of the brethren were going to come after him. And verse 29, at this remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now, he's spot on. Uh, they had rejected Joseph, sold him into slavery, and then here he turns out to be their savior. They had Moses uniquely placed, didn't understand who he was, what he could do. They rejected him, and so he had to flee, and he went into the wilderness. Verse 30, after 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he approached to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look. But the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. There was another instance where that was said. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. It was when the Lord of hosts was standing before Joshua, and he said, uh, take off your shoes, you're standing on holy ground. And uh, then Joshua got the marching orders of how to bring down Jericho. It seemed like a foolish plan, just march around one time a day for six days, and on the seventh day, do the seven time and seven times, and then blow your trumpets. Well, anyhow, um, verse 34, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt and have heard their groans, and I have come down to rescue them. Come now, and I will send you to Egypt. So Moses goes back as their deliverer. This Moses, whom they disowned, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of an angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. So 
he's pointing out that Israel, the nation of Israel, seems to have a penchant for rejecting the leaders that God sends to them. Joseph was maltreated, and then Moses was maltreated, not just once, but many, many times. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, and in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness for 40 years. Amazing! 40 years of signs and wonders leading them around. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel, who was speaking to him in Mount Sinai, and who was with our fathers, and he received living oracles to pass to you. Think Ten Commandments. Our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him, and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. See a pattern here? They repudiated Joseph. They repudiated Moses again and again, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. For this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. He's been up on that mountain 40 days already. He might have died. At that time, they made a calf for crying out loud. They made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the hosts of heaven, as it is written in the books of the prophets. It was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices. Forty years in the wilderness it was, O house of Israel. You also took along the tabernacle of Moloch, for crying out loud. All along they had their foot in a bucket. They weren't really following God. They just wanted to get out of Egypt and slavery. But they didn't want to believe God. And they were worshiping Moloch and the star of the god Rampha. The images which you made to worship, I also will remove you beyond Babylon. So he jumps then to uh, past David and past Solomon and past the split of the kingdoms and past the Assyrian uh, deportation and then to the Babylonian uh, deportation. A lot of ground covered here. So far, they got nothing they can say to disagree with him about. Verse 44, Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness. They had that portable tent. Just as he, was, he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it, according to the pattern which he had seen. And having received it in their turn, our fathers brought it in with Joshua upon dispossessing the nations whom God drove out before our fathers until the time of David. Now David was the one that wanted to build a permanent house. And David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. As the prophet said, Heaven is my throne, and earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? He's reminding them, this tabernacle that you have that's been 40 years in the building uh, as a bribe from Herod to keep letting him be king and has all this gold and everything on it, as stupendous as that is, that's not something that can contain God. Heaven is his throne. Earth is his footstool. Our God doesn't really live in there. Well, they didn't really like hearing that. It's true. It's what the Bible says. Uh, or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? He speaks 
undeniable truth. You men, and here's where he twists it and sticks in the fork. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart, oh, they might be circumcised in the flesh, but their heart was not soft toward God. And ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. You rejected Joseph. You rejected Moses over and over. You rejected John the Baptist. You re killed your Messiah. How are you any different? Every prophet that you ever had, how did you not persecute them? And it says here, which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They had killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You're just like them. You who receive the law as ordained by angels and yet do not keep it. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick. They did not like hearing what was said. Maybe some of them knew what he said was true, and then it applied to them. And they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven, and saw the glory of God. He was looking off into the distance, a heavenward, but being full of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus standing, he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, let's just a little comment here. When the Holy Spirit was sent to uh, the apostles on the day of Pentecost, and he said, he went in to the true Holy of Holies, offered himself as the sacrifice, and when he was accepted, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Well, here it says he's standing. And that means that as he was looking at Stephen and what he was doing, the first martyr who would give his life for the cause, he stood. To honor him. Now, I'm not going to go die on a hill for that, but it is something that I'm pointing out to you. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and he said, This is prophetic Behold, I see the heavens opened up, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. The order of man, a man standing at the right. Well, who do you think he th meant was standing there? It was Jesus. And But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. I mean, they just couldn't stand it. There was no, there was no trial to speak of. He was speaking in front of the Sanhedrin and a mob took him. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. I wonder how old Saul was at the time. I'm not exactly sure. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Wow. Just like the Lord when he was on the cross, he said, uh, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. Now, how did they know all of what he said? How did they have it almost word for word? How did they know what was said when he was stoned? Well, that's because somebody with a very good memory, perhaps several of them, and at least the Apostle Paul, had heard all this. And this was down in his heart, and somehow or another that was just boiling and seething and disturbing 
him and he could not reconcile that. He became fearful of the way. And when you are fearful of something, a lot of times you attack it because you don't know what to do with it. It says here, verse 1 of 8, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. You see that that hiatus where it says, just let it fizzle out, that went out the window. And this was a broad-based persecution with men like Saul leading the way on it. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. They weren't running. They knew that if they got arrested, God would spring them somehow, that God was going to protect them, that they would do signs and wonders. And so they just kept their place, and they didn't want to go after them unless something like that happened again. And instead, they were going to stamp it out and go after the little people. And, you know, sometimes when you can't get the leader, you try to uh, make the people who are followers not want to follow. And so this seemed to be the tactic that was going on. Whether this was Satan behind the scenes directing this, this is what they were doing. Verse 2, some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women, he would put them in prison. So the church got scattered. And you think, oh no, what's going to happen? Well, you know what happened. It was like it was like water being poured on oil. And the oil just spread all over the place. And pretty soon there was a church started over here where a bunch of them ran to. And another group, why are you here? Well, we're here because uh, they're persecuting us because we believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, tell me about this Jesus. And they would tell about the miracles and they'd tell about what he said and what he did. And how he came back to life, paying the penalty for our sins. And, and they, they said, you would give your life up for that? Yes, I would. Well, I want to be forgiven of my sins. Is this a way for me to get to God? Yes, it is. Well, how can I do this? You need to pray to receive the Lord as your Savior and accept him as the way to God. And I want to do that. And uh, how, how, what must I do so I can demonstrate that I am part of this group? Well, you need to be baptized. You become oriented as a follower and a learner to uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I want to do that. I want to be part of you. And churches started all over the place. And uh, so, uh, <clears throat> you know, we still have people <coughs> today who have to give their life for the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your belief in Jesus. Change your mind. Renounce his name. Follow Allah. Follow Islam. Follow Buddhism. Follow Shintism. Don't follow anything. Just give up all religion. Don't do it. Uh, Jesus Christ said, He who confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. And he who denies me before men, I will deny him before my Father who is in heaven. And if you have true saving faith and you know what Jesus has done and that has, in fact, paid your penalty and you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, the Spirit of God will rise up within you and help you understand that this is the most precious thing. A man will go and give everything that he has that he might obtain this precious treasure. Why would he even give up his life then to save uh, himself a few miserable years on this earth and give up eternal life. No, 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 he would not. So, my friends, let's have true faith in Jesus Christ, just like Stephen did.